Okay, everybody, good morning. Uh, let's, let's start the forum. Welcome, everybody. My name is Crystal Lopes. I am not Dick Taylor. Uh, and uh, yeah, thank you. Um, actually, Dick is not here today. Uh, he, couldn't, uh, he couldn't be here, so we did the forum anyway. Uh, but, so I'm uh, the Associate Director for the Institute for Software Research. Um, I, I want just to say some, some words about the, the Institute and then I'll say some words about the forum. Um, it's great to see many of you uh, alumni of, of ICS and ISR in particular. It's always great to kind of uh, keep tabs on you every year. Um, the, the Institute is, uh, has what, like 15, 20, 15, 16 years? Almost 18 years. Almost 18 We're years old. Right, so we finish our, our 18 years, so it's actually older than I, my, than my stay here at UCI. Um, so it's going through a, uh, a, a, a devaluation now, sort of a, 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 an important devaluation that the university is kind of deciding what to do with the both. From time to time, they have to renew uh, the institute, so that's what we're going through. Um, and you also know that uh, Dick retired uh, a few years ago, he didn't retire from being the director of ISR, so he's still the director of ISR, although he will retire from being the director of ISR as June 30th. I will take over the next year as the interim director as the evaluation of ISR uh, moves on through the next year, and hopefully they will renew it and uh, this will continue this good stuff that we have here. So that's the, the status of ISR. And so in the process of renewal, and hopefully they will renew it, but one, one of the things that I would like to hear from many of you, <coughs> both uh, alumni, uh, people who work in the local industry, colleagues here at uh, ICS, I would like to hear what, what would you like to see moving forward, because we have sort of a, an open slate. We can actually do, you know, more or less, we can change direction, we can continue, we can, you know, it's, a, it's, an, op it's an open, page now, new, new page, so it would be, I, I will be very interested to know um, from some of you what would you like to, to see ISR doing and how we can contribute to local industry, to, you know, to uh, further the interests of research in software engineering and um, bridging it to, to industry, that, so let me know, I'll be around and talk to me during the break. So that's for ISR, as for the forum today, <coughs> Uh, we have a, a, a exciting, exciting program, two keynotes. Uh, one is uh, 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 Owen Mali, uh, and the other one is Peritar, and they are both connected one way or another to ISR. So Owen was is an alumni from, uh, he, wor he worked with uh, Deborah Richardson here um, back in the 90s. Um, Perry is, of course, uh, a, a you know, in research and software engineering, a very well-known person. I actually know Perry even before I knew about ISR. Uh, we, we worked together in the old, good old days of aspect-oriented programming and subject-oriented programming and things that we were doing that were common between Park and, uh, and IBM research. So I'm very excited to see Perry back here. Uh, so, um, and besides the keynotes, we have a, a number of talks from <laughs> faculty. Um, so, um, in, I, I'm looking forward to hear some of those talks that I haven't heard before. Um, so let, let's start with the first keynote. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Owen uh, O'Malley. He's the co-founder of Hortonworks. He is, uh, has told me yesterday, as soon as he finished his PhD here in the mid-90s, he jumped into the dot-com uh, wave, uh, and he never left. <laughs> so he, he, he stayed, uh, he, he worked, he did all the startup things in the early 90s, it was a crazy time, I was actually there also at, at Silicon Valley at that time, but I, did, I was just watching from the sides. Um, and, uh, but he was actually in the, the, the trenches with, uh, with all of that crazy stuff that was going on, and then he uh, worked at NASA for some time, <coughs> he worked at Yahoo for a big chunk of the time where he was uh, one of the, the main people who driving the, the development of Hadoop. And, uh, and so since then, I guess he decided that Hadoop was uh, too imp more important than Yahoo, so they, <laughs> they jumped off that chip and started their own company of uh, 
basically supporting uh, companies who want to use Hadoop um, and other kinds of MapReduce frameworks. So uh, I am looking forward to hear um, Owen and welcome. Thank you, Krista. No, no, I'm, I'm okay. I've got four kids. Okay. I, can, I can talk loud. Um, <laughs> welcome, everyone. Please ask questions as we're going. Uh, this is really to help you guys, and this is all stuff I've been living. So as Krista said, I was working at Hadoop, and, or working at Yahoo, in web search, actually. And um, so I've been working on Hadoop since before it was even Hadoop. And so this is a firsthand narrative. We actually, <laughs> actually, a couple of us wrote a paper at one point Although it never got accepted because it was all first-hand history instead of like um, reproducible results. Um, so, so where did Hadoop come from? It really came out of web search. Google started and wrote some papers about their infrastructure, about GFS and MapReduce, and of course they didn't release their source code. Um, but they were really brilliant designs. And so they, um, it was really designed for large distributed jobs where you needed a lot of computers doing the same thing all at once. And they emphasized throughput over latency, right? In computers, you always get this choice over whether you want things fast or you want things to, well, fast in terms of low latency or fast in terms of throughput. And so they said, okay, we don't really care about low latency because building the web index is going to take a long time. It doesn't really matter. But we want to use the computers effectively. And we want to run on commodity equipment because we want to buy the most cost-effective um, compute resources we can get. Part of what goes with that, of course, is that you have to assume that it's going to fail. Right? <coughs> if you buy a PC, it'll last for three years, but that's because you're only using it some of the time. If you have a thousand computers all running at the same time and you're using them 24 seven, you're going to get at least five failing every day. And so you don't want to have to do anything anytime one of those fails. Now, what are the other pieces of Google's infrastructure that were brilliant that came out of these papers? The first was that when people were doing distributed file systems, they said, okay, we need POSIX semantics, and they just took that as a given. Google took a step back and said, well, actually, we don't need to rewrite files, right? We just need to be able to append files. And that makes distributed file systems way, way easier, right? So instead of taking for a given that, oh, we need POSIX semantics, they said, how can we change the problem to make the problem doable? And that actually was a huge, insight that let us do a lot of what we um, have been able to do. The other was that you absolutely can't have a choke point. You can't flow all the data through everything. I've seen a lot of distributed systems through the years, decades. <laughs> As Krista said, I graduated from here 21 years ago, and it's true. UCI well, does don't stand. Make me feel so old. <laughs> <laughs> Under construction indefinitely is absolutely what UCI stands for. Um, but um, I've seen a lot of systems where they make a single point where all the data funnels through, and that doesn't work as you scale up because any single point of, of control that you put that's funneling all the data will be killed. I've seen all kinds of systems taken out by Hadoop. Um, one of the admins at Yahoo said, people do stupid stuff all the time. Hadoop lets people do stupid stuff at scale. And it's really true. I've seen people take out filers, web servers, anything that is a single resource that people access from 5,000 machines at once will go down. You can almost guarantee it. Um, on the other hand, as I said, the reliability was baked into the framework, so you didn't need to buy expensive hardware. Um, one of my friends was running the Hadoop clusters at LinkedIn, and they'd always bought very expensive, reliable hardware, Solaris boxes actually, with redundant power supplies. And 
he wanted to get away from buying these redundant power supplies and they weren't accepting his, his need that they wanted to do this. So he logged in to their cluster, pulled up a page and said, okay, pick a node. And they picked one in the meeting. He logged in, did a halt, not a shutdown, nothing graceful. He just halted it. And he said, you don't see any of my pagers going off, any of my team's pagers going off. Everything has moved automatically. And that is why that's important. <clears throat> of course, that later came back to bite him because he'd shut it down without recording what he'd done. And so the next month they were like, why is that computer down? And he goes, oh yeah. <laughs> and then he had to go restart it. Um, <laughs> and so where was I? I was in the web search <coughs> team at, at Yahoo. Um, we built a graph that crawl, of the crawled web. We had 100 billion <laughs> URLs and a trillion links between those. Okay, so it was a huge graph and we needed to do whole graph analysis in order to build the web index. Um, and it took a month to run on 800 computers. And we're like, okay, we need to do this better. And um, instead of a proprietary C++ framework, which is what we had, we wanted to, to move to open source and we wanted to model it on the architecture from Google. Because a lot of the reason it took a month was because um, the failure handling wasn't as good. It was designed when the web map was running on 100 computers and not 800. So we actually started working on a C++ one of our own based on the papers, but then our management started thinking like, okay, so we want to open source this. Getting permission from Yahoo Legal will take forever. And um, there's this little open source thing over at Apache that um, is being used by Nutch, which was an open source web crawler. And they implemented the papers, and so let's use that. And it was written in Java, we were like, really? <laughs> but uh, because it was already open source, it was much easier to get Yahoo's permission to contribute to it. Although, I think the lawyers had this vision that we were going to be um, contributing a few fixes here and there. <laughs> they didn't quite realize that before they actually got around to finalizing everything, we multiplied the code base by a factor of 10. <laughs> so yeah, a few patches <laughs> here and there. Um, we quickly split it out into a separate project. Actually, that was partially because of Yahoo Legal again. Um, they really, really did not want us contributing to an open source search engine because of the Apache uh, trademark or patent stuff. So we split it out. It was 5,000 lines for HTFS, 6,000 lines for MapReduce. Actually, I don't know the current numbers, but they're huge now. <laughs> and um, it only scaled to about five machines. Actually, at that point, it really, the right model is a grad student prototype that had been done for a paper and was now getting released. Um, I actually went back and looked at that old code last year for the 10th anniversary and it was just very, very primitive. Um, now we looked at that and like, okay, this is not going to work on 800 machines. Um, so we're like, okay, web map is going to need to wait for a while till we can scale this thing up. But we found another group of users who was really, really desperate for our attention, and those were the data scientists. And they were actually able to use Hadoop, and getting the users early was a huge important factor in making that work, because getting that feedback from real users, running it at scale, was absolutely critical in making this stuff work. One of the, the things that's become very clear very early was that in distributed systems, it doesn't matter. You do the math to make sure that it's possible, but in order to actually make sure that it works, you have to run it at scale, right? You need real customers doing real things at scale to make sure this stuff works. Um, now, as we started having, we started with the data scientists, at first we had to pull, pull the data from each group. We had to get permission and work with them about how to, much we could pull at once. But eventually, that tide reversed. 
right? It, instead of us pulling all the time, they wanted to get their data into the Hadoop cluster because really data has gravity and it will pull other data to it. So once you start making that data center available and pulling the data in, other people will want to get their data in the same system so that they can combine it with data sets in new ways. And this is important, right? Because you're letting people do cool stuff with the data and the data lets you do all kinds of amazing things. And um, it let, makes it trivial to access the stuff at scale. And unlike a lot of the, the systems, for example, uh, Yahoo had this one process where they were loading everything into databases. Well, databases aren't great for loading log data into. And it really hampered them. But because the only way they could store the data at scale was the, the SQL, by moving that to Hadoop, they gained all the, a bunch of different ways of accessing that data because Hadoop will let you access the data the way you want to access it instead of um, forcing you into a particular engine. The other piece that's important is that you, have, you gain a lot more security because when people start implementing these projects, they um, don't worry about security. Actually, even the first version of Hadoop was completely open, and the, there's a group at Yahoo called the Paranoids, and when they figured out that you could pretend to be someone else by passing a command line argument, they weren't happy. <laughs> and so we actually had to go through and implement security. But as a result of that, other customers can pick up Hadoop and, and run with it, and they automatically get the scale and auditing that's built into the platform. Okay, now I touched on the fact that uh, Hadoop grew out of Nudge, which was at Apache. So I want to cover a little bit about the social part of, of why Apache was important. Um, Apache, by the way, I saw Roy walking somewhere. <laughs> Nothing like giving a talk about Apache to Roy Fielding. Um, <laughs> Apache is a federation of projects. Um, it's a wide range of projects. So they actually have very little um, in common with each other other than the way they run their, their um, development processes. And they give the projects a wide range of choices. Um, for example, most of the big data projects are reviewed and commit where people have, someone has to look at the code plus one it before it goes into the code base. Other projects do commit then review where people just commit things that look good and then other people look at the commit logs and say, oh, that's no good <laughs> and we need to make changes. It kind of depends on which way your project um, wants to run things. But what's important out of that is that Apache isn't setting a overall direction for the technical stuff. They set direction in terms of how the, the projects interact. When I was a grad student here at UCI, one of the classes <laughs> I struggled with a lot was the uh, society and computing one because I was just like, I care about the tech, I don't care about how this interacts with people. Actually, the people matter, matter a lot, actually. And um, one of the things you find in open source is that politics is actually important. Um, and Apache is really focused much more on the community. So they've got a saying about community over code where it requires open development, open <coughs> governance. That means that we use email for everything. Part of the reason for that is Email works regardless of which time zone you're in, right? If you're setting up instant chats and things that are time sensitive, then you're really could, you're cutting down the access for people who are in different time zones. And while that can be okay, it, you want to be more open than that. You also want to be open to people regardless of which company they're in, right? You don't want to have your project locked down. And you want to give power to the people who are doing good work. That's just generally a good practice. But it also means it's a democracy. It's not a dictatorship. So that's where the politics comes in. right? If you want to make a, a change, you need to figure out, OK, do I have enough political capital to make this change and get the community to buy into it? OK, now, so that's 
great, and Apache lets us do lots of interesting things. But there's a wide variety of, of life cycles for these projects. We often see them get released first on GitHub, or some company throws them onto GitHub. But that doesn't develop a community, right? They're just releasing it, the source code out. They may even put it under the Apache license, but that's not nearly the same as putting it into Apache. If they want to go into Apache, they need to go into Apache Incubator, and um, Apache Incubator is there to teach people how to um, be an Apache project. <laughs> the other way you get there is you split off of projects, and so actually this is one branch of one of the pieces I've been involved with, but Lucene split off into Nutch, which split off into Hadoop, which split off into Hive, and then into Orc. So there's a lot of these branches, and that's a very common pattern, actually. Um, so projects start off, they gather community, right? You want users, contributors, and developers. Open source projects live by their community. If the community dies, the project dies. And so actually, the health metrics at Apache really are about measuring the community <coughs> and seeing who's doing what, right? You can evaluate the health of an open source project partially based on what, how many releases they've made recently, but mostly about how much traffic is there on their email list, how many committers have they made recently, how many PMC members have they added recently. All that stuff matters. But when projects die, at least if they're Apache projects, they go to the attic. Okay, so that set up the ecosystem to evolve, and there are a lot of big data projects, and I apologize. Engineers have a amazing talent to name projects in amusing ways to them, but it makes it really hard for people to figure out what these things do, right? If you didn't know what Hadoop was, the name tells you nothing. Um, although some of them actually do make sense, and, and there are stories behind all of them, of course, like Zookeeper, for example, the Yahoo research team that came up with that, the manager was like, okay, you've been naming things after animals, no more animals. So they're like, okay, we'll name it after the guy that can, is in control of all the animals. So we called it Zookeeper. <laughs> so there's always a reason behind these things, but of course sometimes there's more than one reason, but we'll get to that later. Um, but, and because Apache doesn't lock down the technical direction, right? If you look at the Free Software Foundation, they have a very firm technical direction about what they're going to allow. Apache doesn't do that, so we end up with competing projects. And those projects that are competing actually are competing for users, developers, for some publicity, but they also tend to copy features from each other. The other piece that you have to consider when you're in this world is if you need a feature that someone else implemented, do you use them directly? That's what happens most of the time. But what if you need changes, right? If you need changes, then you either need to work with that project to um, make the changes, or you need to copy it in and fork the project into yours. Or you can start a new project. Obviously, people think long and hard before starting new projects. Although, okay, so if you work with the, the other project, that works great, except there's a different set of people. That means you start hitting Conway's <coughs> law, and all of a sudden you need to worry about the organizations mattering, and you can't force changes on the other people. The other thing is that younger projects often release faster, right? They're more active, they're more vibrant, they are changing faster, and so younger projects really can't do that to old projects. For example, when HBase was young, they actually needed changes to Hadoop's RPC, and they thought about contributing it back and making it work, but instead they're like, well, we're releasing too fast, Hadoop is releasing too slowly, and so we're just gonna copy it in. That's created a bunch of duplicate work, lost opportunities, there are bugs that have only been fixed in one and not the other, but on the other hand, it was probably the right decision because um, HBase was moving much, much faster than Hadoop. So these are the, the kinds of things that we think about all the time, right? Whenever we need to, to uh, make changes, we need to, to figure out what the right approach is. Okay, now one of the pieces 
that we needed to work on early was isolation, right? Hadoop gives you this cluster resource, you want to work on it independently. Um, <coughs> it didn't isolate people very well. And people wanted to run different versions of HDFS and MapReduce, so we created Hadoop On Demand, which used the Tor scheduler. But that graph over on the side is actually what a MapReduce job typically looks like, right? You start with a bunch of maps, and then you do a bunch of shuffle, then you do the reduce. Well, if you look at that, Torque allocates things in blocks, right? You allocate so many nodes for the whole set of time. That meant that hot for this whole picture would be having to allocate up here. And so you've just wasted a lot of your cluster. So hot existed for a while, but then died because it was wasting too much resource. The next iteration on this was to um, work on schedulers. And to be honest, there's a lot of research work left to be done on schedulers. People haven't done enough on this. Um, but Facebook was early in, and they wanted to maximize for low latency. They created the fair share scheduler, which basically gives you Everyone gets some access to the pie, um, to the cluster, so that big queries don't block out the little queries. Yahoo, on the other hand, wanted to maximize throughput, but then share it between multiple organizations, right? A single organization, you could be fine getting stuck behind someone, but if it's between multiple organizations, the, the organizations that put money into the cluster want their fair share of the cluster, and so, that's what the capacity scheduler did. And so they were just two different approaches. In open source, the way you do that is you make it pluggable, people can choose which one they want, and, um, but over time, they've actually copied features from each other, and so you can actually do most of the stuff with either scheduler now, it just is which way that uh, you want to default your behavior. Now, that was, Good, and it gave us a lot of control. But then Berkeley wanted to be um, able to run other services on their Hadoop cluster, right? Hadoop lets you run a bunch of, of services, um, but they held up had to be MapReduce. And they wanted to be able to run other things. So they created Mesos. The Mesos uh, actually originally started on GitHub and then went to Apache. Um, and it lets you support different versions of Hadoop. Inter users still interact with the individual services, but you, um, the actual workers on the machines get allocated um, to the service. It scales to thousands of machines, but security was an afterthought. The services have to play nicely with each other. Um, they can't, you, if you wrote a service that was bad, it could take all the cluster and you wouldn't hear about it. So if you look at the architecture, it looks like this, where the MPI jobs could be running, there's a static MPI scheduler, talks to the Mesos masters and gets executors. The Hadoop jobs talk to the Hadoop scheduler and it, so it, it basically divides up your cluster. And Twitter still uses this a lot, actually. Um, but we looked at this and we had a lot of the same problems. We wanted, we had data scientists that were doing machine learning, doing MPI, doing graph processing, all of it in MapReduce. None of that is a very good fit, right? So you're doing a lot of processing that, that's abusing the framework rather than using it right. Um, and so you needed, uh, we also needed to scale up the MapReduce clusters. The job tracker was doing way too much work tracking all the MapReduce state. And we wanted to stop saying this part of the cluster is map slots, those, those parts of the cluster are reduced slots, and we needed security because the paranoids would never let us go back. But so MapReduce was definitely our hammer, <coughs> and we needed to change that. <laughs> So what we did was we divided a MapReduce into two pieces. We called it Yarn because it's yet another resource negotiator. Actually, there are two pieces for reasons for that. The, it starts with a Y because at that point, um, Cloudera had found it and was taking credit for everything. And we were like, okay, we're gonna make this one start with a Y for Yahoo. Um, 
So the clients come in, they talk to the resource manager, and now instead of having the masters outside the cluster, you've got the masters inside the cluster. And that means that all the MapReduce processing happens in these app masters, and they ask for containers, but the resource manager is much, much easier than the uh, job tracker was, and so it can scale up a lot higher. So doing this, um, Yahoo was able to increase their utilization a lot. They, the big clusters went from running 80K, 80,000 jobs a day to running 125,000, and they doubled the CPU utilization. They were actually able to retire 1,000 machines out of their cluster and still be doing more work. Um, and we were able to support the researchers who were trying to run different things on their cluster, right? So we were able to take Hadoop made and what was working for it and let people do things other than MapReduce. Um, now, some of the downsides, it's a really complex API. Unfortunately, those app masters are really hard to write. Even the guys who wrote the yarn book are like, yeah, it takes you about six months to get an app master that works right. Um, and a lot of that is things like <coughs> split brain. Split brain is where your cluster has uh, two copies and there's a failover and you need to make sure that the one that got failed over from is actually dead dead before the new one starts taking over. And all that is left to the application. That's kind of unfortunate. And the other piece was that because we were really starting with short running apps, well by short running I mean days or minutes but not forever, the standing services wasn't so, as good. So we were hitting a lot of the same points that Mesos was doing, but we were, um, but we hit a slightly different target. So you can see it's two different gaps in the ecosystem that, that the two projects were hitting. Now I wanted to show a little bit of what Yahoo found on one of their busy clusters. This shows um, jobs grouped by how many containers they allocated. So the, the green bar is the percent of all apps the blue is how much CPU they use, and the red is how much total. So you can see that there's an incredible number of small apps, but they actually don't use the cluster very much. It's mostly the mid-range that actually use the cluster, which is part of why Yarn is tuned the way it is. Okay, so that, that's what Hadoop looked like. So what about higher level tools? Um, one of the data scientists really hated Java. He felt it was just way too verbose. And so he wanted to, to use MapReduce without writing in Java. That was great. So he actually implemented a framework uh, that let you sub-processes and use standard in for your input and standard out for your output. And um, that let him write Python and shell scripts. It was much easier to debug because if you just have a Java API you're implementing, that is more awkward to test. But that didn't give you any high-level grouping of jobs, although Hadoop Streaming took, ran for a long time, and it was one of those that we didn't actually plan. It was one of our users coming in and saying, hey, here's this cool feature that I implemented. And it became very, very popular for a while. Um, but at some point, people are like, okay, one MapReduce job is great, but what I really want is to be able to string these together without thinking about it. And so Yahoo implemented PIG. Pig um, was named Pig because it was uh, able to consume anything, right? So it can eat all <laughs> kinds of data. Although I don't think they were thinking about the results of what happens when pigs eat, but <laughs> they called the language it uses uh, Pig Latin and actually the shell that does a redevelop print, which is called Grunt. And Pig let you do a lot of these things that were very hard, right? It made it so that it was converting the jobs into MapReduce, but you didn't need to worry about the details of how to optimize your MapReduce. And it uh, let programmers do things a lot faster. Actually, the, the pig team for a long time teased me that pig jobs were faster than MapReduce. I'm like, that doesn't make sense. <laughs> of course, they meant that programmers other than me could <laughs> get results that were faster than a, than, a, um, than a person who didn't know MapReduce very well. Um, but yeah, 60% of, of Yahoo's jobs were pig. And um, 
that works great. However, when it comes to data access, people really want SQL. SQL really is like the lingua franca of, of accessing data. And so pig actually is a lot more convenient for a lot of things, but people really wanted SQL. And so Facebook had these data scientists, they wanted to use SQL, and so they implemented <coughs> Apache Hive. And um, it's become very, very important. The framework generated the MapReduce, kind of like Pig did. Um, actually, the, the other piece of Hive that has been really important is it had to find a meta store so that people could define where their data was and how to access it. And that's actually being used by a huge number of other projects like Impala and Presto, Spark, SQL. Um, and the original optimizer was a complete mess of rules. Um, actually, if you want a, a good lesson about how not to run a software organization, yeah, looking at the original source code for Hive is a good example. Um, when I was working on Orchid, which was a piece of, of Hive, um, I said we should rename Hive to Moria because it's a maze of nasty levels all combined together. So we were working on those. Um, now, Cloudera came out with Impala because they really wanted a faster sequel. <laughs> and it started as a GitHub project, eventually moved to Apache, partially because they realized, hey, People aren't using our project because it's not actually got the open governance out of Apache. And so they moved to Apache. It had a more standard SQL and a faster answers. You didn't have to wait 30 minutes to get your MapReduce jobs to finish. They also had dedicated servers, so you didn't have to worry about that. Now, when Cloudera did that, we were like, oh shit, <laughs> now what do we do? And we thought about shipping Impala, but at that point it was a GitHub project, so we're like, well, we don't really want to ship something that we don't have control over. And so we decided we needed to do something else. We thought about um, starting a new project, but actually that's the um, approach that MapR took, and they started Drill. But we decided that we were going to make Hive better, and we put a lot of work into it. Actually because the people we mostly took from to work on Hive were the Pig team. <laughs> Pig actually started losing its community, right? So it's still alive, it's still got lots of users, but the development has really slowed down, and it's largely because we started working on, on Hive full speed. So we've improved the SQL uh, capability. We went to vectorized processing. Now people sometimes think of that as, um, oh, we started using GPUs. No, that's not it. Actually, most Hadoop clusters, at least in the past, haven't had GPUs because GPUs burn power and cost money, and you don't want that if you're trying to get the most compute for the buck. Um, but we, instead, the original design of Hive was processing each set of data through each operation a row at a time. That meant that things didn't run very fast. Instead, modern CPUs, because they have to page in their memory, have to work much faster if you process things in batches of a thousand rows at a time, because then you can have a very tight loop with no dynamic dispatch, no branching, and you just run full speed. Um, <coughs> so we did that. We also invented a columnar store called ORC. ORC stands for Optimized uh, Row Columnar Format. Of course, it was really because I liked the image of ORC. Although, because I was the primary creator for it, people have often accused me of naming it Owen's RC file. There's no <laughs> truth to that. Um, we also, as part of that, we also implemented a new system called TES. Now, TES, we started as a separate project, although they're um, down. So, ORC, we started inside of Hive, which was okay for them. But TES, we started as a separate project. Although it's used for high pick and cascading at this point, it really wasn't intended for non-frameworks. And so there, people don't write applications in TES directly. And that actually turned out to be a mistake. It means that they don't, the TES guys don't worry enough about their APIs. And so it's hard to use outside. And so it takes <coughs> a lot of specialized knowledge to use TES. And 
the other piece that shows that you probably actually do want, um, we probably should have made TES just a part of Hive, is that for each version of Hive, there's one version of TES that works and vice versa, right? So they really have to get released in unison anyway. And that's unfortunate. Um, okay, so that was great. So now we had our top level, system, top level query tools. But now people are like, okay, now how do I get data into our cluster, right? That we've got this great compute cluster, but you have to get the data in. Yahoo had a proprietary framework, so they didn't care. But now we were outside, and so um, people started to fill in that piece of the ecosystem. So the first attempt was called Flume. It really. Uh, you can see the architecture here where you basically were throwing data into the sort. It would run the channel and then write the sync. It was all a push model, right? You had to push the data into the system and it was difficult to make uh, more complex flows. You didn't have any replication. If your server went down, you lost data. And there was no security. People weren't very excited by that. Um, so LinkedIn, decided they needed a better solution. They talked to the Flume team, but the Flume team didn't see eye to eye about the changes that they needed. So LinkedIn actually implemented Kafka, which has rapidly become the, the de facto for this kind of um, processing. It's a full model, so you can really think of it as a bus. You write data into it, and um, the clients read whenever they, they are ready. That means that if a consumer is down for a while, you don't need to worry about it. Kafka will buffer it up and the client can read it when they're ready. It also means that you can have splits. It's easy to, to set up things. They can set up security. It actually is doing really well. Meanwhile, the NSA, no such agency, uh, was working on their own flows um, processing system. They, of course, had very different environment, so they developed a very different tool. And actually, that's the real GUI that you see when you're running the system. And instead of Kafka's single point of you write data here, you read data from there, it actually lets you set up flows. And those flows are expected to be cross data center. And there was security built in from the top. And furthermore, it lets you um, communicate backwards. It remembers where all the data came from. And so it's easy to say, hey, I want more data like that, so that the links, you don't necessarily transfer everything, right? If you're running this on devices, you may just pull summaries of the data and then you say, hey, I want more things like this, that looks interesting, and then it'll actually transfer the additional data that you need. So you don't necessarily transfer everything up front. You can go back and ask for more details later although it's got a lot of the same properties as Kafka. Okay, now when we started with Hadoop, the machines typically had eight gig of memory. Um, that was a lot back then, <laughs> but that number has grown quickly over the years. And so one of the pieces that has changed over the years is that um, now we have a lot more memory, right? These days you see anywhere from 128 gig to 256 on the commodity nodes. Um, so I went to give a talk at Berkeley to the machine learning guys. They're like, okay, this is the processing we do is we read it once, we do all these iterations and write out the final results at the end. It's like, oh, you can do that with MapReduce, but it's really painful because you end up with this long stream of MapReduce jobs. So you end up with 50 or more jobs running back to back. Um, they're like, oh, we can do better. So they talked to their big data guys and uh, they created Spark, which uses Gala to um, run on distributed data set. So they basically did these, uh, they kept the results in memory using RDDs, which is a resilient uh, distributed data set. And they were able to load the data in once, process it, and produce their results results much faster. Um, but see, you can see it's not about Spark being better. It's about Spark having a different spot in the ecosystem and being able to do different things because the environment had changed. 
right? If you tried to run Spark on an 8 gig computer, you would not be happy, <laughs> especially if you had multiple people doing it all at once. Um, Spark, on the other hand, has grown over the years and now has a huge number of sub frameworks. They have graph processing, machine learning, um, SQL, and streaming. So, what did they do right? They had excellent APIs. Their developer support is amazing. Um, they've got the read eval print loop, which lets people see what's going on. And they, um, the cross framework APIs are really nice. So it's not best in the class in any of those pieces, but if you need to use SQL and machine learning and want to plug those together, Spark is by far the easiest way to do that. Now what, if, what is not so great, well first is that they're an umbrella project. If you remember, Apache is really about communities, right? And Spark really has five different sub-communities underneath. And as, at first they actually tried to control that with um, making super committers where, uh, where you had to get permission from that a committer on that area to commit. <coughs> Apache came down on them for that, but they still have these different communities, all of which are in their uh, under one PMC, which is unfortunate. The other thing that you talk to customers and what's really hard is that there's a long curve to take things from proof of concept to in production. So, for example, eBay will get a POC up and running pretty quickly on Spark, but then getting it to production takes a year, <laughs> takes a long time, because you have to figure out, okay, how do you handle running out of memory, how do you deal with all the, the failures that happen as part of it. Now, of course, over in Hive, we had done a lot of work using the vectorization and uh, LLP and or Pez, um, but we wanted to get down to sub-second responses to queries. And unfortunately, JVM startup is really, really slow. First of all, there's a lot of jar files that you read, so there's a lot of I.O. every time you start it. Uh, when I was at Sun, actually, they had a, a standing rule that you weren't allowed to implement command line tools using Java at that point, because the JVM was so slow to start up. That was pretty telling. Um, it also uses just lots of CPU for this just-in-time compiler. So when your Java process starts up, it's running, but it's running slow. And it takes another second until your just-in-time compiler gets, gets everything compiled that needs to be compiled, and then your throughput is much higher. So our solution was to leave processes running. We, because now those were long-running processes, we could even cache the columns that were hot and the partitions that were hot and enforce security, right? So now if you have Hive queries that are accessing LLIP, if you have Spark queries, they all get the same security process. And we've been able to use Hive to pro uh, query a table of six billion rows in less than a second. So if you know where Spark or where Hive came from, that's an amazing <laughs> amount of improvement. Now, of course, LAP. See, again, it's engineers being geeky. It, of course, stands for live long and prosper, but we made it live long and process. I thought the Hornworks marketing team was going to blow a gasket when we told them what LAP stood for. <laughs> Our marketing team does not like <laughs> engineers naming things. They're like, what are you doing? <laughs> so you can see the difference in the architecture. So the original high use MapReduce on the back end, and um, you end up with the map that reduces right to HTFS, the next set of round mappers and reducers right to HTFS. You end up with another job here, and then you pull them all together. With Pez, now your reduces can write directly to the other reduces without both going back to the end of the queue and without um, doing a um, right to HTFS. And now with LAP, we've basically just moved this part of the processing into the standard servers, so you just have to do the stuff at the bottom. As a result, the line going down, it, because these queries were sorted by how much they sped up over the MapReduce version of Hive. And with LAP, the, so you can see that the speed up goes anywhere from 225 down to about five. 
time speed up in the fifth derivatives. So it's going well. So okay, those are, are the big pieces. I one of the pieces that always comes up though, and I wanted to talk to these, the researchers about is one of the refactoring is really hard. Um, now, at one point, we tried to split up Hadoop into different pieces, and we picked what we thought were logical pieces of the shared library, common HDFS and MapReduce. One of the pieces that we failed to, commute, to think about, though, was we actually screwed up the communities that way, because there isn't a community for common. There were HDFS committers, there were uh, MapReduce committers, but there weren't any common committers. And even worse, we made a strong tie, there was really a strong tie between common and HDFS because the fundamental interface to HDFS was the file system and that was coming through common. It actually made a mess. Furthermore, at that point we were using Ant as our build system, which made the cross project releases a pain in the tail. And we really needed Maven and Nexus to make that work. Um, and actually even the Java class loaders. Again, something really screwed up with the, the class loader stuff. Jars were set up so that you could um, download things quickly from, because Java was originally a web app language. And Jars worked great for that. Java really does not work when you need shared libraries because the class path really needs to have the whole things listed. Okay, so I talked about how Orc we started in Hive, that um, it's a columnar format, and we put it in Hive originally because we wanted it to have easier integration with Hive, and that worked. Actually, part of the reason we did that was, again, politics. I just watched someone with uh, the Avra format get shot down for putting connectors into Hive, and because we didn't, they said, oh, Hive doesn't need more file formats. It's like, oh shit, I've got one that it's almost done <laughs> that I want to get integrated with Hive. And so uh, I was like, well, if I name it and work and put it into um, Hive, then they'll take it. And they did, actually, they were excited. Uh, of course, it was really the guy who wrote the original RC file, so he thought optimized RC file was a great title. Um, so, but over the years, it got entangled, right? It, um, I took a pass trying to pull it out. Uh, another engineer took a pass trying to pull it out. And then I was like, okay, we have the technology. So I took some of the, the Java library stuff and wrote a little tool that figured out the dependency graph between the classes. Yeah, there were 16,000 classes outside of Hadoop and Protobuf that um, work depended on. That was a mess. <laughs> and that's exactly why it had failed. So I, the little tool actually took the root set of work classes that we wanted, ignored the system classes like Java, Hadoop, and Protobuf that it was clearly going to need to depend on. And what I found worked the best for that was actually sorting um, by the depth from the work root classes and using the dependency weight of how many classes that class depended on so that you could factor out the big heavy classes that Orc was depending on that it didn't need and make changes. And of course, it had the forward and backward dependency graphs. Okay, now, API compatibility. As, we, as I've said, a lot of what's happened over the years is that Maven has made it really easy to build layers of this stuff. And so we have lots and lots of layers going up and down the system. That works great. If APIs don't break, but they always break. Um, in general, the people will agree that breaking APIs is bad. The hard part comes when deciding what is a public API, right? And we have had numerous discussions with different developers saying, hey, you can't break that, that's public API. And I'm like, oh no, it's not. I'm like, yes. <laughs> it is if people are using it. Um, now, Sometimes people are like, well, well, can't you just use the public keyword in Java? And no, you really can't, because public in Java 
is necessary even if you are reaching from any other package, even if that package is internal, right? You don't even get, if it's a sub package buried underneath, you can't reach up, right? None of that works unless you make things public. So public doesn't work. To get around that, Google, actually Hadoop, and Yetas, which is a, a project at Apache that does uh, check in, uh, it reviews patches before they go in, all have visibility annotations. And that's part of the problem is that there's not one set that people use, right? There's a whole set. And it's really hard to know what users are using a particular feature. And it would be great if someone would mind GitHub and Maven Central to say, hey, these are the pieces of the APIs that are getting used. This is what you can change. This is what you can't change. And you know, this version will, will create pain. Ah, oh, Google. Google has quite the reputation for releasing awesome software and then breaking compatibility all the time. Um, and it's really a feature of their build process. They build the code every single night. And so protobuf, which most of the big data projects use for their serialization, deliberately breaks compatibility. People have filed bugs saying, hey, you broke compatibility, and Google closes it as not a bug. And the, the patch had, I mean, the bug had a patch. This is how you fix it, and Google will close it saying not a bug. And their view is that everyone should regenerate code to using the current version. Well, that's great if you're building the entire stack every night. If you're Instead of pulling things out of Maven Central, it doesn't work because that leaves the rest of the world with this thing where either the entire stack of projects depends on a protobuf version, which is exactly what we've done. Everyone's using 2.5 at this point and uh, ignoring the higher versions of protobuf. Or everyone needs to shade the protobuf classes and make their own copy. Actually, some of the, the projects are doing that too. Actually, Guava is the other piece that just breaks all the time. If you can avoid, depending on Guava, oh, shoot, sorry. If you can avoid, uh, sorry, I've got one of the Macs with the touch bar. Swiping things is a bad idea. <laughs> um, um, yeah, so we end up shading the protobuf classes too. Okay, so I just had some final thoughts. Um, one is that software engineers need to continually be learning new things, right? You read these reports about um, not being able to program <clears throat> after you're 30, and I'm like, well, gee, I'm 52, and <laughs> I'm still having a fun time programming. So, so that's clearly not it. The, the hard part is you have to keep learning. You have to be aggressive about it, right? If I only knew Pascal and assembly language like I graduated from UCLA with, yeah, I'd be unemployable, but fortunately I've been learning things along the way. Um, in the long run, open source wins. When I was at Sun in 2000, I was like, you know, this Linux thing is getting really good. You guys should be thinking about that. They're like, oh no, Solaris is way better. <laughs> yeah, that lasted for a couple of years. <laughs> and it was, Solaris was way better, but it didn't matter, right? Open source wins eventually. Um, internships at Companies provide great opportunities. One of the pieces actually, that even at Hornworks, that we miss is access to big clusters, right? It's really cool having to, the capability of rebooting 5,000 machines at once <laughs> and knowing that you're going to be running a petasort on, on that many machines. Um, so internships are, are great. Um, tools make a huge difference in what you can do. The current tools like Maven make it easy to create layers. Actually, Maven is really good for Java. C++ on the other hand still sucks, right? You still need to have um, either references to the system libraries or you need to copy them into a third party to build your C++ tool. Um, the environments change and the ecosystem adapts, right? It's, there's a reason that we end up with all these parallel projects. It's not that the people are, are just trying to create confusion. It's that the ecosystem fundamentally changed and now you need to do different things and different things become important. And so multiple groups end up working on the same thing and that's okay. Actually, it makes all the projects stronger in reality. 
creates confusion for the users, but in the long term, they win too. Distributed systems are also fundamentally different from traditional ones. When I was at NASA, some other researchers had access to this high performance computer and they took their program that worked great and they did the distribution, but they made one master that was all the, doing all the work and then sending it, or figuring out who needed to do what and assigning work to the workers. They didn't think about, oh, all that communication and coordination at the master is going to kill their performance. And so they, they actually ended up getting slowdown instead of a speed up by using this very, very expensive computer. And um, so you would just end up with a very different pattern, right? If you can avoid the checkpoint, uh, choke points on your data, that works much, much better. Okay, that's my slides. Thank you for listening. I'd love any questions. I'll be around all day, so you can hit me afterwards if you don't want to ask in a big forum. Any questions now, though? Thank you, Owen. So, being somebody who was born on the organizational side in grad school than the technical side, um, why is it that Yahoo continues to put so, much, so many resources into open source? It seems as though, and, and certainly, maybe Yahoo isn't what it used to be, <laughs> but at, at one point, Yahoo was one of the leading firms in the industry, and by putting all these resources into it, it was helping the rest of the industry. There were, definitely was a piece of that. Of course, okay, so let me talk about the benefits. Um, there were, clearly were dangers, right? We helped Facebook a lot <laughs> when we released Hadoop. Actually, I was part of the team that went to Facebook, and. Um, said, hey, you should be using this Hadoop thing. And they're like, oh yeah, that'd be great. <laughs> and that ran. Um, now, of course, Facebook is way bigger than, than Yahoo is. Um, but the, the benefits really were about a couple of things. First, it made it very easy to attract developers, right? People wanted to work on open source. Shoot, I me mean, personally, I wanted to, to work in open source because if you're working in open source, then it doesn't matter if the company shuts it down, right? If Yahoo had sold itself to Microsoft and had closed down at that point, we could have still kept working on Hadoop. It would have been good. Where if you're at a company and the code is in the company, then when it closes down, you can't go anywhere. The other piece is that people had no idea that Yahoo was doing uh, interesting work in distributed processing, right? So we used it for publicity. Right? We got to talk to people like the Berkeley team that were doing exciting research in distributed computing precisely because we were open source. Right? If we'd been closed source, no one would have known about it, even if um, they were in the field. And finally, the open source platform, we got students coming in as knowing Hadoop. Right? We had people learning this. If you talk about a proprietary framework, like the one we had for WebMap before Hadoop, you had to train people up on how to use it. There were no books on it, right? You had to do everything by reading the code. Now, you could argue that the documentation for Hadoop is still between the curly braces, but um, <laughs> actually one of my friends works at Microsoft and that's very much, it takes him a lot of time, it's like, stop looking around for the answer, just read the code. <laughs> um, because they're just not used to that, right? They're used to reading the documentation. But being open source meant that you have those resources available, right? And you get people feeding you enhancements back from outside. And so it's really about that. Although I must admit that at one point we went and talked to some of the outsourcing firms in India and they're like, so what's your angle from, <laughs> like, yeah, no, Yahoo wasn't trying to make money for this. Actually, the first Hadoop Summit that we held, we couldn't even con figure out how to get Yahoo to take money for it. We wanted to charge 100 bucks for it, and Yahoo couldn't take money <laughs> for holding a conference. They just had never done it before, and so they had no process set up. Um, so yeah, no, Yahoo was really just releasing it for the publicity and for the goodwill um, and to make recruiting easier. <coughs> Any other questions? 
think I'm about out of time. Yes. Yeah, so um, I worked as a Hadoop app developer mm -hmm. for a while. And I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and one of the things we saw going from Hadoop 1 to Hadoop 2 and getting Yarn was that the execution models changed, right? You, mm -hmm. you went from purely MapReduce to a ton of different things. And right. the community really blossomed in developing all these different execution models. Now, as an app developer, um, you're kind of stuck very much to developing towards which uh, execution model mm -hmm. you're, you're using. Is there any work in kind of doing an abstraction on top of that so that as these execution models develop, your app will actually be able to run on so various apps? Yes and no. There are lots of attempts to do things like that. Um, for example, Microsoft open sourced a project called Reef that talked that was like, okay, here are the libraries that you can use to build distributed apps. Spark also kind of does that. But no, actually part of what keeps the ecosystem working is precisely that flexibility, right? Everyone's not locked into one set of APIs. So unfortunately, no, not really. It's one of those cases where the ecosystem is working, it's vibrant, and it's in the long term, good for users, but in the short term, definitely introduce. Because you pain. have to choose up front. It's like, am I going to do Spark? Am I going to do Flink? Am I going to do, you know, you can't. Exactly. And so, agree. The, the ecosystem is very frustrating for users <laughs> <laughs> because of all those choices. But on the other hand, I would say that you end up building organizational expertise. And so, you don't let your developers go out and do whatever they want. You end up doing whatever you've been doing and starting proof of concepts in, in the new ones. Um, and everyone does that, yeah. to be honest. Um, but no, there's, I don't think there's actually a way to, to pull everything back together again, and I don't think we'd want to. Okay. I think actually having the, the ecosystem allow the diversity is better than, than the short-term gains of, of having a community. Any other questions? All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you.